Hello, welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe. I'm actually filming from a hotel here early Thursday morning in Boston. I uh, spent the whole day yesterday with our custodial partners at Fidelity Investments, just a series of uh, various meetings at Fidelity, and now I got to jump on a train and get back into New York. And so filming early, market hasn't opened yet Thursday morning, but so far this week, uh, markets are up. We had one of the larger days up of the year on Tuesday, made up all of the downside from last week and then some. Uh, yesterday, the Dow was down a little bit, the, the S&P not quite so much, and that will happen sometimes in the Dow and S&P for different reasons are, are somewhat uncorrelated to each other. But we'll see what happens Thursday and Friday. Uh, either way, I think that the um, the slightly elevated levels of volatility here the last few weeks are healthy, um, becoming a little bit more common, which we think is, is good, and also very much reinforcing the silliness of trying to time around this market. Um, there's no particular primary driver at this point, and it's a great opportunity for us to uh, do what we do and to reinforce in things like this video and our writing the principles around this dividend growth investing that we've made our hallmark at the Bonson Group. Um, the things I kind of want to share with you this week do pertain to dividend growth investing because it's interesting. This year you have some of the very high growth, high octane type names in the S&P 500 being the names that have led so much of the market. The market has still had a wildly successful year so far. And yet you would think that with energy underperforming and a lot of the dividend oriented sectors like consumer staples to some degree, but more so telecom, um, not uh, uh, maybe um, you would include in the utilities um, that you would think that those things would be underperforming. And yet the reality is, is that the dividend growth space is having a very, very good year, even with energy underinvesting. In our case, part of the reason for our success this year is because emerging markets have, uh, you know, you have an S&P up, let's call it eight or nine percent, a Dow up eight or nine percent, maybe 10. And yet you have emerging markets up over 25 percent on the year so that um, more attractive growth space where there were lower valuations has provided quite a boost um, in terms of the growth aspect of one's equity portfolio. But within the dividend growth area, as, as more of a longer term understanding of the, of the benefits to why we believe in companies that are perpetually growing their dividend, representing not only in terms of the offense we need out of our portfolio and the return profile we're seeking, but also from a defensive standpoint, that even though it's still exposed to market risk, we think it represents a superior alternative to, re, to receive a, a lower volatility experience. Um, you can look to uh, the debt ratios. On average, if you look at just the dividend growing companies within the S&P, they have something in the range of a half of the debt to equity that as far as a ratio that the non-dividend, excuse me, that the whole entire uh, market has. But um, you would think, okay, well, that's nice in theory. It seems like there's healthier balance sheets, uh, lower leverage ratios in the dividend growth areas of the market. But let's look at it in practice and beyond theory, an actual real life downside. I read a study yesterday on the train coming into Boston, 17 years going back to 1999. So you're talking about through two nasty bear markets that if you take every single month that the market was down and isolate just the dividend growers, that you had 44% less downside for the dividend growers than you did for the whole market. If you look at the 15 worst months that we've had, okay, so you're talking about some real doozies going back over 17 years, the downside level of the dividend growers was half of that of the entire market. So I think that this just sort of provides a little bit of understanding as to in real life, why we believe the, the health characteristics of companies that are perpetually growing their dividends represent a uh, uh, more um, downside protected, less volatile scenario for an equity investor, all the while still maintaining the return characteristics offense um, growth, growth of income that one wants as an equity investor. 
So again, I've said this quite a few times, but the downside to it is that there are these periods of time, usually very short-lived, where the hottest things in the market are not going to be the dividend growth type names. And you go, oh, wow, there's such a hot dot. Four or five technology names, for example, are taking off and we don't own those. Generally, in those periods, there's still a positive performance environment. It doesn't have to necessarily be that way, but there, it's usually the case. So you're just simply talking about for short periods of time, hotter areas of the market doing better. But in longer periods, you not only get a great return characteristic, but you have a much lower risk profile. Well, this is not something that we're kind of tactically doing in this environment because equity valuations are high, although they are. And because geopolitical anxieties are there, because this bull market's been going on for a long time, um, for whatever different reasons an investor may feel, I want to be somewhat uh, risk managed. Those things are all cases to make for the way that we believe equity markets should be approached. But we don't believe it just in this period of time. We believe in any period of time. We think that that optimal risk reward trade off can be found. And, and it's just it takes a lot of work. It, it's, it's not something that can be passively done. One has to go out and do the work to find companies growing their free cash flow and growing the dividends that they're paying from that. So that's the approach we're taking right now. We care a heck of a lot more about that than we do anything President Trump says in a tweet or a press conference or a rally. We care a heck of a lot more about that than anything the New York Times puts in a headline of the newspaper. We care a lot more about that than we do um, the particular short-term machinations or speculations about what a central bank or Federal Reserve may do. And we think that it drives a much better investor result in the long run. Quickly, I'll wrap up. Uh, positive news out of the news cycle. I do believe, and I'm, I'm really researching this heavily, following it um, as closely as I can. I really do feel very optimistic about where tax reform is headed. Um, for those that are curious, I'm embarking upon a very significant research project um, as to whether or not I feel, for the first time in my career, ready to to take a position in the country of Japan. Even if I did it, I wouldn't be taking a position in Japan, I'd be taking a position in companies on a bottom-up basis. Dividend growers, by the way, our dividend growth philosophy doesn't end at the U.S. borders. We believe in the same thing when we go into um, other countries as well, developed nations like Japan or Europe, etc. But um, there's a number of macroeconomic cases and some, some studies that I'm embarking upon that have me very interested. Something ha interesting happened this week. I look back to the day that I began my career in financial services many moons ago and where we are now. And the Nikkei, the kind of S&P 500 of, the, of Japan, is at the exact same level. Nearly 20 years and not a single dollar has been made. Um, and there's been some big gyrations along the way, but literally a flat line from where I began and to where we are now. Uh, something I guess I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see that we've, uh, throughout my career, for totally different reasons, um, I can talk about another time, spared our clients that uh, extended no return experience. Um, I've gone on too long, so I need to let it go. Please do read DividendCafe.com this week. There's a lot of material there covering a number of other topics. An updated chart from our uh, partners at Strategist Research regarding the signs of the bull market topping off. And they list out nine indicators, and you can look at what those things look like to get an idea of the lay of the land right now. I need to leave it there. i got to go catch a train. Um, any questions at all, please reach out. Thanks for listening to Dividend Cafe.